staff at Yardner Commons, but uh, welcome everyone to a really a special event. Um, and welcome to uh, the Department of City and Metropolitan Planning event. Uh, and so I wanted to recognize a couple of people before I introduce Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox to you. Um, Professor Harwood is here, for, who is the chair for our Department of City and Metropolitan Planning. Um, anyone else here I should recognize, mm -hmm. escaping me for a moment. But I also want to thank many people across the, the university and across the community for assisting us to uh, stage in uh, this event. Uh, thank you to the Utah Education Telehealth Network. Uh, I think I got that right. Uh, Fernando is here and Nicole in the back. Uh, so they are live streaming this event uh, for those who couldn't attend in person. So thank you for those and welcome to everyone online. Uh, but thank you to uh, the facilities managers at Gardner Commons. Thank you for the staff at the registrar's office for scheduling. Thank you for parking and commuter services, for um, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor's um, uh, guest parking uh, location. Um, and so thank you to everyone else. And thank you for the staff from the Lieutenant Governor's office. Tyler, thank you very much for everything you've done. I want to recognize Tyler Kane, who is a graduate from the Department of City and Metropolitan Planning and still a student here now uh, doing GIS work. Uh, so Tyler, thank you very much. And Lieutenant Governor, thank you for recognizing the wonderful skill set that she's moved into your office where they're now uh, helping. Um, Taylor, thank you for, as well from the, gov the Lieutenant Governor's office for being here as well. Um, it's a special occasion for me, and I want to ask uh, Lieutenant Governor's uh, uh, omissions, if I could, and some privileges, if I could, when I refer to him incorrectly. Uh, the first thing is, uh, I may re refer to the Lieutenant Governor as Mayor. Uh, that was the first time he and I met uh, when he was the Mayor of Fairview, uh, where he still resides. He was formerly a City Council member uh, in Fairview. I uh, got to know him when he was Mayor, and then went on and moved on to be a County Commissioner for San Pete County. Uh, He's had an illustrious career uh, as he's moved forward, uh, moving into the House of Representatives, the elected official from uh, that area of central Utah to the member of the House of Representatives, and then appointed by uh, Governor Herbert to be his Lieutenant Governor. I should back up though a little bit and say thank you to Lieutenant Governor Cox's family for letting him be here tonight. Uh, they still reside in Fairview, and I wanted to speak to that issue for a moment, why that is, and he's commuting over 100 miles uh, to the state capital and back every day. I uh, did a map quest on it, it's approximately an hour and a half if the traffic is great. Uh, so who knows, it might be a lot different when the traffic is not so good, so he could give us an insight there. So if I refer to him as mayor or county commissioner or uh, representative, you'll know. That. The other thing I want to ask a concession on, coming from a Commonwealth country, if I refer to the Lieutenant Governor as the Lieutenant Governor, he will understand completely uh, because I'm sure he gets that in Canada or another Commonwealth countries he, he travels to. But it's my special privilege to welcome uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox with us. I've asked him to make a presentation on the focus of small town uh, and, and resort planning, but I'm sure he'll move in the small town direction because of the inordinate amount of experience he's had working with smaller communities. So without any further ado, I want to welcome uh, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox to us. Before I do though, remember these little tricksters? Can you make sure we turn these off so it doesn't interrupt the presentation and uh, those who are participating online as well? So Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox, thank you very much for being here, for your courtesy, and for your family to let you be here. <laughs> Apologies as well. When we scheduled this event, we didn't know it was going to be a Utah Jazz we game. We did not know. And so, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Lieutenant Governor. still be live streaming the game. I, <laughs> I was this close to canceling on you, but I, <laughs> if I do, karma will prevent them from winning. Right. So, so, this is very informal. <laughs> thank so, you. Thank you. Very well, well my, my hope was that if I did show up tonight, the good things would happen and that, that karma uh, would rub off on them. I will say, and, and uh, my this, I was, uh, I was at the game on uh, a, a, a couple days ago when, when they won at home, and uh, I'm going to take full credit for that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working for it. Okay, we'll take credit together. All right, we're good, we're good. Um, it 
it is so good to be with you, and I appreciate Bruce uh, for that, that very kind introduction. He and I did get to know each other when I was serving as the mayor of Fairview, and I'll kind of work up to that. We've got a lot of time together tonight, and uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my story in my town, because it's unique to me, but it's, it's also not that unique. I think it's very illustrative of a life in rural Utah and, and uh, in rural America, although there are some distinct differences here in Utah for sure. But um, I, was, uh, I was born in, in Fairview. Uh, for those of you that don't know where Fairview is, if you look at a map of the state of Utah and put your finger in the middle of that map, you will be pointing to Sandy Town. Uh, that uh, Fairview is a town of about 1,200 people. Um, it, you might know Sampy County for the big cities, which are um, Ephraim or Manti. Those are the big ones. Uh, Snow College, located in Ephraim, uh, and, and that's it. Um, Mount Pleasant is where my wife was born and raised, which is right next door to us. Um, you've got Gunnison on the south, Fairview on the north, and about 13 municipalities spread throughout the county. About 28,000 people in the county, which actually makes it one of the bigger counties in Utah, south of Utah County. There are 13 counties south of Utah County. Of course, Washington County, King George, Iron County, Cedar City, those are the two big ones. But uh, Sandy County is the biggest one of the, the remaining 11 by quite a margin. 28,000 in uh, Sampy County, at least in the last census, it's probably closer to 30,000 now. Sevier County, Richfield, about 20,000. Uh, Price and Carbon County, also about 20,000. Uh, Nephi in uh, Juab County, about 12, probably more now as it's been growing. I'm guessing closer to 18. Census, but that's that kind of gives you a little bit of perspective. But I was raised on the farm that my great 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 grandfather settled about 160 years ago. So two brothers were sent down to settle Manti. Um, one brother stayed there, the other brother, Manti, got a little too big uh, for him, so he moved his, his family to Fairview, and that's where the Fairview Coxes ended up, which uh, only goes to show that we don't get out much. Uh, we've been there ever since, and um, it, it, it's, it was fascinating growing up in, in a very, very small town. Uh, people ask me all the time, what's the best part about growing up in a small town? And I'm like, it's that you know everyone, which is really cool. And I, they ask, what's the worst part of growing up in a small town? And it's that you know everyone, uh, which is really not cool and, and awful. It just depends on how things are going for your family and, uh, and your neighbors at the time. But um, I, 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 I love my, my town, and, uh, and, and I want to share a little bit of the history of that town. Fairview was a, a thriving uh, small city, had everything you would ever want in, in a town. There was a, a very impressive movie theater. Uh, there was the dance hall, which was actually the first building, the first community building that was built down there. Uh, the, the, the Mormon pioneers, as they moved in there, that was important to them to have a place where they could recreate together, where they could entertain, where they could put on plays and do uh, all kinds of things. So they built this building. And to show the ingenuity uh, of, the, of these people, um, it, it started to wear down a little bit, but they put in this, this, this wooden floor that they had handcrafted, it's just an incredible wooden floor. And the, the building wasn't that stable, and so about 30 years later, they decided they wanted a bigger building. Um, and, and instead of tearing it down, um, because they wanted to preserve this wood floor, um, they actually built a new building over the top of that building and then dismantled the building inside one brick at a time and carried it out the front door. Uh, so that was, again, they, they wanted to preserve the, the important pieces of, of history there. Um, there were, there were you know, grocery stores and ice cream shops. Um, there was a department store. There, were, there was all kinds of retail there. There were um, 11 dairy farms in and around the surrounding area. One of those dairy farms was the, uh, was the Orville Cox Dairy Farm as it was passed down. That was our farm. And um, in 1904, um, they wanted telephone service in, in Fairview. And uh, the, 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 the predecessor to the Ma Bell back in, in the early 1900s wouldn't bring telephones from Mount Pleasant to Fairview. And so four farmers decided they were going to do this, and they started a little co-op. They got their horses and their wagons, and they went out, and they, 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 brought, um, they brought a telephone line from Mount Pleasant to Fairview. And in 1919, there were, uh, there were 25 telephones in town. And uh, my great-grandfather said, hey, I, this is a good investment opportunity. I've got the farm. I'm going to buy this. Uh, I'm going to buy this telephone company. And so we did. <coughs> and it remained in our, um, in our family 
for a long, long time. So he had he had his kids, and uh, he had two boys, and he decided to pass it when his um, his fame and fortune, which wasn't much onto them. Um, my grandfather got the farm, and uh, his brother got the telephone company. Uh, we got the bad end of that deal. Um, but again, still a thriving place, just a great place. My dad refers to it as Mayberry, which probably doesn't mean a lot to some of you, uh, but there's an old television show, the Andy Griffith show, that uh, that was the town they lived in where everything was just kind of perfect, right? You had the, the town cop and you, you had this cool place and, and everybody watched out for each other and took care of each other. And, uh, and then something happened. Um, uh, as transportation goes, the, uh, the state and the nation decided to expand the freeway system and, and connect all of our states together. And uh, Highway 89 ran right through the heart of Fairview and, and the heart of Santee County all the way down. And there was a lot of discussion about where the new freeway would go. And uh, the freeway ended up not following 89. It did follow 89 for a ways until you get to Southern Utah County. And then, and then they, they, they part of paths. Highway 6 and 89 continued down. Um, I-15 continued out around uh, to Juab County and the Unified all the way down to St. George and eventually to Las Vegas. And with that, any of you seen the, the cartoon movie Cars? Is that maybe not too old for, for many of you who've seen Cars? Um, Cars is the story of Fairview and the story of so many of our, our communities in the town. I, I saw Cars for the first time with my kids and they asked me, Dad, why are you crying? I just, just kind of saw it because it's so close to home because that was it. I don't even remember the, the name of the town. In cars, but um, it, it, time had kind of passed it by and, and left it, and uh, and that's what happened. Um, all the stores eventually closed down in Fairview. Um, when I was a kid, we had a grocery store. Uh, that was really the only kind of retail left, that, with with a couple exceptions. My uncle and my dad started selling snowmobiles because we are the gateway to Skyline Drive up there. The Canyon people like the snowmobile up there. They started selling snowmobiles, and that took off. And uh, that was kind of it when I was a kid. Eventually, the grocery store um, closed down. To this day, we still don't have a grocery store in Fairview. Um, Mount Pleasant, seven miles away, we, we do. There's, there's another, uh, another snowmobile dealership, so we have two snowmobile dealerships. Um, we had one gas station forever, and uh, we got a second gas station that changed hands multiple times. It eventually closed, so we're, we're back to one gas station now. And uh, the, the theater burned down when I was a small child. It was never rebuilt. Um, all of these incredible buildings just kind of dilapidated over time. Not all of them, some of them were preserved. Uh, my grandpa used to say that poverty is the great preserver. And uh, they, uh, they didn't tear stuff down because they couldn't afford to build anything else. So they tried to keep the stuff that was there. Some of it just, just eroded and corroded over time. Um, one of the towns where, where that didn't happen as much is, is Spring City, which is, you may have heard of. It's actually probably more famous um, than some of the other towns, depending on what part of Utah you're in. Um, if you go to Park City, everyone knows about Spring City. Uh, Spring City has turned into an artist community, um, but it was preserved because even Highway 89 bypassed it. And, and, uh, and so there are all these, in fact, it's, it's one of only two cities or towns in the entire country that are on the historic register. So buildings are on the historic register, but only two uh, municipalities. One of them is Colonial Williamsburg. The other one is Spring City, because all of these pioneer homes still exist. Fairview, some of that is true, but not nearly as much as, as Spring City. And, uh, and so that happened over time. The, uh, the dance hall that I talked about um, changed hands. Uh, the church owned it for a long time, um, actually conveyed it to the city for a dollar. Um, the city would lease it out to people for different things. And when I was growing up, it was a skating rink on that, that, uh, that old um, pioneer wood floor. We would roller skate around on that pioneer wood floor. And eventually the ceiling started to collapse a little bit and, uh, and it, was, it was unsafe for people to be in there. And so for, you know, for about 20 years, no one was in there. Um, so this is my, you know, this is my town, and, and this story again isn't unique to uh, to Fairview. 
it's, it's true all across the country. Now, the rest of my story is this. Um, my, dad, uh, my dad went to school, wanted to go to college. Um, again, college was not something a lot of kids did, when, especially from these small towns. He went to Snow College. His dad got sick, um, with, he was diagnosed with cancer, and he knew he was gonna have to drop out, come back and, and, uh, and, and keep the farm going to, to take care of my grandmother. Um, so he did that, dropped out of school, went to work for his uncle, who owned the telephone company at the time. Um, it was struggling to get by, nearly bankrupt. Um, my dad kind of helped save that, sold the milk cows, kept the farm, and uh, they gave him a partial ownership in the, in the company, started to turn things around, started buying other, um, other telephone companies, Moroni in Sampe County, Schofield, just little things that, that um, US West at the time were, was selling off. And uh, the company slowly started to grow from about five employees in 1985 uh, to about 15 employees in 1995 to uh, when I got a chance, and I'll tell that story to move back, there were about 45 employees in, uh, in 2003. Um, and, and, uh, and so that was one little ray of hope, one, one little bright spot in this, the largest employer by far in Fairview, right? No, nobody else employed more than, except this, this um, the elementary school, which we have there, uh, that employed more than 10 people or five people even. And so, so that, that's kind of what was happening on our side. So continue to farm, the farm always lost money. It was more of a hobby than anything working on the, on the telephone side and trying to change that. So that was the, the world I was, uh, I was born into as a kid. Um, we, uh, you know, everybody in Fairview, we went to, to Fairview Elementary. We all knew each other. Um, the, uh, of course, the predominant church, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints played a very important role in that community. <coughs> we have two church buildings. Those were the old, those were the nice buildings in town, the buildings that were kept up. And, uh, and, and where uh, any investment at all was made. And so, so my, my parents got divorced when I was 10 years old, um, which was a little hard, uh, something, again, in a small town. The bad side of that, the downside of that, is that um, you see, you know, people talk about you, a lot of rumors about what's going on with your family. As a 10-year-old, that had a big impact on me, struggled a little bit. <coughs> um, can I just might grab me some water? Thank you. Um, so we, uh, so so that was that was a little hard for me, and uh, I, you know, I came with this mindset that I wanted to get out of Fairview. Thank you. Wanted to get out of Sandy County and uh, and never come back. Right? There just weren't many opportunities. I knew there would never be many opportunities for me there. My Marco Rubio moment. I call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we. Um, so I, I, I had a chance, I, I went to Snow College again, which is kind of what you did if you were going to go to college at all. Um, we, uh, um, it, we called it 13th grade, you know, because everybody just kind of went there. And uh, I served a, a mission for my church in Mexico, came back. Um, my, my high school sweetheart was almost engaged. Um, and I, she, dear John, me, but fortunately hadn't sealed the deal yet. Um, I came back, uh, convinced her that, um, that, that she should choose me and let us go to another time. It has nothing to do with urban planning. Uh, but uh, but we, uh, we, we, we got married, went to Utah State University together, and, uh, and then I went to law school at, at Washington Lee University. And um, I had a lot of options, decided to come back, and, uh, and went to work for a big law firm here in Salt Lake City. And, uh, and, and decided after a lot of conversation that we, uh, that it was important to, uh, to go back. My dad had called and said, hey, look, I'm gonna retire sometime. Um, and I'd like you to come back and, and run the company, take over. Take, I want you to take a huge cut of pay and uh, come back and raise your kids on the farm. Isn't that what you've always wanted to do? Um, it wasn't what we had always wanted to do, uh, but we had three boys at the time and my wife grew up on a ranch in Mount Pleasant on about 500 acres. I grew up on this farm, again, very poor, uh, but, uh, but 150 acres, um, and which seems like a lot, but again, the way it was settled down there, everybody had land, it just wasn't worth anything. And, uh, and so, um, but we were on a quarter acre in Kaysville, and, and, uh, which was great, but we didn't know, you know how to raise three boys, because we had been raised very differently. And, uh, and, and so we, we decided to make the leap and go back to our, to our community. And so as I moved back, it was fascinating to see it through a very different lens because I had changed as a person. I, I 
had an education now. I had lived in I lived in Virginia. I had lived in a big city. Um, you know, worked in Salt Lake and lived in Davis County, and now I was coming back to uh, to this this small town. Um, and nothing had really changed from the time I was growing up. Now our company had changed and we're starting to change, and it was one of the, the rare places that did change. And one of the things I did was to recognize that we couldn't survive in a changing environment that with, with technological changes. People were not going to have telephones on their walls with a cord, you know, for, for much longer. Um, cell phones we knew were, were going to take over. Uh, people would be cutting um, the cord on the television. We, we, I, in fact, one of the things I did was try to get us more into the television space. But, but we knew that fiber optics were, were going to be the future of telecommunication. And so expanding our network, getting customers out of the small town would allow us to keep those jobs in the small town. So we very aggressively invested and expanded our, our fiber optic network throughout the state. We got into downtown Salt Lake City. Um, and in fact, uh, a lot of those new buildings you see in Lehigh that are coming up, Silicon Slopes, many of them are actually running on, we renamed the company, it was Fairview Telephone, then it was Central Utah Telephone. We renamed it to Centricom. Um, and Centricom is now providing um, fiber optic services, high-speed bandwidth, and um, Ethernet to big businesses uh, along the I-15 corridor, which is pretty remarkable, which allowed us to keep those jobs. And, and uh, I was able to grow the company from about 45 employees to about 100 employees uh, now when I left. I, I no longer have any involvement with the, with the company. Um, but that, that was really important to maintaining that. It's the one thing that is a little different from many small towns is to have an employer like that located in Fairview is, is not common at all. Um, but, uh, but there were some other things that happened when I went back too, and that is um, uh, I had a friend come who was on the city council, and, uh, and he said to me, he said, look, somebody moved, we have an opening on the city council, and we talked about it, and we've, we've decided, we, we get to appoint someone, and we really want you to apply, and we want to appoint you. And I was flattered, and I said, thank you, you guys. You know, tell me why you think I would be a good city council. And he said, well, the truth is we have a lot of legal problems, and we can't afford an attorney, <laughs> and uh, we, we desperately need you to do, do free legal work for us. And so I did, and uh, probably did $20,000 worth of legal work, and, and you know, got paid 200 bucks or something. And, and that was great, and it felt good to, to be able to give back and help build the community. After that, um, they, uh, the mayor decided not to run again. They asked me to run for mayor, and that's when I met Bruce. Um, we worked on, on a planning project together, because one of the things I realized was that, uh, at least I thought at the time, so this is 2005 when I, when I get elected, and the economy is booming now in the state of Utah and across the nation, and, and people are looking to expand off the Wasatch Front, and we had developers coming down and looking at our small town and seeing all that land that wasn't worth anything and uh, having big plans. Uh, there was uh, one of the farmers sold his farm and there was a plan for about 250 uh, homes down there. Now think about it, in a town of 1,200 people, you know, we probably only have, uh, I, I don't know how many homes we had in Fairview, maybe, maybe 400 homes, and now somebody wants to add 250 homes out there um, right next to, to using the city um, the utilities and, and resources. There were other subdivisions that were looking to come in and I started to panic and realized we needed some professional help to make sure that the tail didn't wag the dog, that we actually plan for this type of growth. And I, I called the best person in the state and that was Bruce and he came down to help us work through that. And just as we're getting it all set up and everything's ready to go, uh, now this is 2007, 2008, uh, the Great Recession happened. And all of those people who had all of these grand plans left, and it never happened. So, um, but but it, again, it's very interesting to see as a as a potential shoulder county, we're a little further away. What that type of growth could do to a small town. In the end, it never happened, and, and maybe it never will. I don't know. But um, we're we're still very much the same town we were then in 2005. Um, and and so I got to see it from a, a local perspective. And, and we were desperate to, uh, to grow down. Now, by the way, before you think, hey, that's, that's pretty impressive that this guy got to be the mayor of his town at age 29, you know, that's a big deal. It's not a big deal. Everyone gets a turn in these small towns. <laughs> and uh, in fact, if any of you were in student body office somewhere, you probably had more people vote for you then than I had for me 
when I ran for mayor. I think that we had about 300 people vote in that election, right? So, uh, so that's just kind of the way it worked. My dad was the mayor when I was eight years old. Really, everybody gets a turn. Um, but, but it also speaks to this issue because every town, every city has the same problem the big city has. Um, we, we have all of the same problems more than ever before. We're a very litigious uh, society, right? People want to sue the city. Um, you have uh, you have problems with your you know if somebody's sewer backs up. Um, you, you you have all of these same issues. But the difference is you don't have the resources and you don't have the human capital to solve those problems or figure it out. Um, you know Bruce would know better than I, but I'm guessing we are one of the the, the very few cities of that size or even close to that size that has ever engaged in this type of a planning effort. This doesn't happen because one, people don't even think about it. Two, we don't have the resources to, to do it in, in, the, in the first place. And so there's a, there's a human capital issue that, 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 that absolutely matters in these small towns. And um, I refer to it, and it's true everywhere. My wife calls it STP. Um, it stands for the same 10 people. Um, and they're the same 10 people that kind of do everything. They, you know, they're the ones that volunteer at the school. They're the ones that, uh, that, that, that run for office. Um, they're the ones that, that, that do church activities, all of those different things. There's just a, a very small group of people, and getting others involved is, is hard to do. Now, what's interesting is, is I had this conversation with my dad, um, and again, I, th this has to do with planning, but, it, but it, it's, it's bigger than that, because um, I, I believe at the core of what's happening out there, we're, we're seeing this increasing divide in, in our country. Um, and I'm going to talk a little about politics because I think it, it does play. And, and I absolutely believe that what's happening in small town is, uh, in, in, in some part, maybe even large part, responsible for the state of politics in our nation today. Um, if you look at a map of the 2016 election, you'll notice uh, very clearly that um, the red votes all came from more rural places, and the blue votes all came from big cities, by and large. Of course, there's exceptions for that. But I, I think it's important to, to try to understand that, that dynamic and, and how we've got here. And again, I think Fairview is a perfect example of, of that. Um, interestingly, my, my dad tells me stories, and my grandpa told me stories as I was growing up about all these characters, and I knew some of them. They were older. But these were personalities. These were characters. These were people who were really different. They were, they, we would consider them weird today. Um, and, and everybody had a nickname, and they, they, they were just larger than life personalities. And, and I remember asking, uh, asking my, one of my uncles, as they were, they were sharing some of these stories, I'm like, why don't we have stories like this now? And he said, well, well something happened um, that changed this. He said, television ruined our, our small community because we didn't know we were weird. We didn't know we were so different until we started watching TV and we saw what, what families and communities were supposed to be like. And so we, we all started to change our, our behavior a little bit because of this. And, and he said that was, that was a, and I never thought of that. That was really interesting to me. And, and of course, the, the internet has hastened that uh, a little bit. But the economic opportunities, when you, when you look at the way Fairview was, a very self-contained, right? Um, you had everything you needed within that town, which meant there was a lot of economic happening because people would work there and there was trade and, and you would shop there, you do things. So, so transportation started to improve. I mean, when my dad was a kid, they never went anywhere. Um, he talked about going to Provo, which is about 50 miles away. Um, that was a really, really big deal for them. You know, it only happened a couple times a, a year. Everyone was poor. That was the other thing my dad would say. We were all poor, but we didn't know. When everybody's poor, you're not poor, right? Um, you don't know any better. He said, you know, the, the Great Depression ended, and everyone forgot to tell Sampy County uh, because that just was who we were. We farmed the way they did during the Great Depression. That didn't change. Um, and so, so you had these agriculture communities. Um, then, then you had mining, which was really important. So coal mines were developed um, in the mountains between us and Emory and Carbon County, and power plants grew out of that. And so 
what was interesting was you had the, the, the farming community there, but the, the wealthy people um, were those who, who worked in the coal mines, and they would travel up and go below ground and make a lot of money, terrible job, really hard job, but that's what they did, they, they mined this coal. And then transportation started to change, and I mentioned I-15, and cars got better, they got more efficient, they became cheaper to travel, uh, they became safer to travel. And, uh, and those habits started to change because, because once you could get to Provo fairly frequently, then you could shop in Provo, right? And there was, there was more to choose from and prices were cheaper. And, and so you would do that. I remember after you know, my dad married my stepmom, uh, she had three kids and uh, I lived with them and uh, then they had a couple together. We had the three family, we were still very, very poor at the time. And so they would save money, and we would, I would actually clean bathrooms as a kid um, at some of the local establishments to raise money um, to, that I would give to my parents so we could afford food for, for all, of, all of us kids. And once a month, we would, drive up to, uh, we would drive up to Utah County, and we would go to, it was called Food for Less back then, it was kind of one of these warehouses, like a Winco or something, and we would buy all of our food for that month, right? And, and we weren't alone in doing that, which was really good for us and helped us. It was terrible if you owned a grocery store in Sandy County, right? Because now you're, you're losing that retail. So, so it, it becomes, now it's not a self-contained um, uh, uh, city. Now, now the economics is spreading, which is good for people. We could afford more, we could, we could have nicer things, but it killed, it killed the economy in, uh, in these small towns. And, uh, and that's, that's true again across the nation, so that's gone away. And then you start to, and then you start to see, you see it on television, and you realize now um, with the internet and as you travel to these other places now, you realize ah, you really are poor, right? Uh, and and so you, you want to have better things, and you, you kind of aspire to that. Um, and and uh, and now you can travel further and broader, which is good and important. It helps us um, increase our, our 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 mental capacity and 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 the things we know about the world and other people. Um, but it also it also destroys the, the, the world around you. Um, the idea of somebody commuting 200 miles round trip to Salt Lake, like that never would have happened when my dad was here. That was impossible. And yet I've been doing it for five and a half years. It's still not great. Don't get me wrong. We mostly suck. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but it's it's possible. And uh, and so so that that whole dynamic has just uh, has just changed over time. Now, so. Uh, so, 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 and then, and now we have this new economy, and this disruption that's happening. And now that disruption is happening not just in rural areas, but it's happening everywhere. But you can imagine reading about Silicon Slopes, and and reading about that Utah has the best economy in the country, more private sector job growth than anywhere else in the nation over the last two, three years. Remarkable, something that people thought would never be possible. And uh, you hear about all these new jobs. And we are making lots of money and, and, and driving new cars and building new houses and everything's great. And you're sitting in these rural towns going, well, wait a minute, um, you know, the old economy has left us, the coal mines have closed, um, they've laid off people, that's all you know. The new economy isn't finding us. Um, I have my job and it's fine and people are doing their thing and we're scraping by, but there's no future for my kids. And this is where it gets really personal is um, my kids now have to go, uh, I want my kids to have it better than me. To have it, because that's what every parent wants. It's for my kids to have it better than me, they have to go to school, which means I have to send them out somewhere. And then if they get a degree, they never get to come back. And that makes, that makes me really sad, right? Because as we've done some studies around the state, Envision Utah um, did this uh, a couple years ago, and they found out what people want more than anything is they, as they get older, as they age out, um, what do they want? They want to be around their family. That's the number one fear that they have is not being close to family and what's going to happen to them. And, and there is no hope or future. And, and what else happens here is, think about it. So, so now if the, 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 the smart kids or the bright kids or the talented kids, the, the ones that, that can go to college, that can get accepted, right? They leave. Um, and never come back, what, what happens to those communities? There's a little bit of a brain drain, right? It gets, it gets harder and harder. Um, and who stays? Well, those that struggle, those that, that can't do anything differently. 
Um, important book that I think everybody should read um, is it, Senator Ben Sass wrote recently called Them, um, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. And he's talking about this divide in there, it's a political divide in, in a godly way, um, but he, he, he posits, and, and, and this, is, this is, is scientific, we are more divided um, politically in our country, um, more divided now than at any time since the Civil War. Okay? And he's trying to figure out what's happening there. There's a researcher in, uh, in Florida who posits that there are three classes, and they're not the classes we're used to in, in the United States. We usually talk about the, you know, the lower class, the middle class, and the upper class, right? He posits that it's three different classes, the, the, the mobile, the rooted, and the stuck. Now the mobile are people like you, people who have education. Um, they, you're built for the new economy um, because the new economy is changing so rapidly. You know, I had a friend who graduated from uh, 40 years ago who said, um, who said, when I graduated from college, I had all the knowledge I needed for the first 30 years of my career. He was retired. Um, that will never happen again, right? We're, many of us graduate from college without the knowledge we need for the first uh, year of our career. And that's not the college's fault. That's because careers are changing so rapidly, right? The marketplace is changing so rapidly. Um, so the mobile are used to that. They, they can go, you can go from city to city, from, from, uh, from state to state, from country to country. You can find a new job. You're happy to move after three years. You make a lot of money. Life's good. But maybe life isn't good. Um, the, the second group, the stuck, these are the people I'm talking about. We have more of them in rural Utah, than in rural America than anywhere else. People who are where they are, not because they choose to be, but because they don't have choice, right? And, and uh, intergenerational poverty, we have a lot of that um, in, our, in our state and, uh, and in our country, especially in rural areas. You know, their, their parents were on welfare, um, they're on welfare, they, you know, they, they, they don't have the tools, they don't have the social capital to get out, they don't have uh, the education, and the old economy isn't there anymore, the new economy is not going to save them. Um, and then you have the rooted. And, and this is the, the smallest segment and the most shrinking segment of, of our society. And, and the rooted are those who um, could be part of the mobile, uh, have education, have social capital, have the ability, they're successful, but they choose to put down roots um, someplace, uh, wherever they are, and, and uh, some of them in rural Utah. I'm part of that, that rooted class that decided to move back even though it didn't make sense on paper. I had to take a pay cut. Um, but I moved back because I wanted my kids to, to be raised there. Um, and, and they're the SDP, the same kind of people, the people that give back to the community, the people that volunteer, the people that use their social capital to help the stuff, um, to lift people up. And that's what we need more of, and that's what we're missing. Um, communities are falling apart, and Senator Sass posits that we are lonelier than we've ever been. Um, and there's a lot of science to back this up. If you ever read any of the Putnam stuff, uh, he's, he's really good on this from Harvard, uh, talking about um, we have fewer friends uh, as a society in the United States than we've ever had before. People, true friends that you can you can share your innermost feelings with. We have fewer of those. We know fewer of our neighbors um, than, than ever before. We interact less with our neighbors more than ever before. Um, volunteer organizations, so think about Rotary Club, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, the Elmer Flag, all of those things that used to exist were really important to the foundation of community. They cease to exist. Uh, if they do exist, um, they're mostly people over 70. We just don't see as much, much of that anymore. And social media has filled in that void. Um, the problem is with social media um, is that it, it has a tendency to bring out the worst in us. So we're lonelier, we're looking for belonging, and we, we fall into this, this, this type of tribalism where we fall into groups where at least we can hate the same people, um, and, uh, and we become more and more politically divided because now we can surround ourselves with only people that think like us. We never have to interact with anybody that's different. We've been segmenting ourselves as a society for a long time that way. Um, so if you have money, you can live in the avenues in Salt Lake, and only a certain type of people live in the avenues versus those that live in inner city versus the, those that live in rural Utah. We've been dividing ourselves this way, like we do on social media. We do it to push up a button, but now we do it by where we build our houses and where we, where we live. So that all has it, but there is a final piece to this, and I want to talk about economic development, and then we'll, we'll move on to the to uh, the, the Q&A and, and some interaction back and forth. Um, so the, so how, do we, how do we fix this? And I, I don't have all the answers. I've been struggling with this. Uh, uh, but, but I think it's important to recognize what doesn't work. 
um, to rebuild these economies. And let me just say, rural matters. Please trust me when I tell you that. I had a, I had a member of the legislature say from, from urban Utah, I won't say who it was, um, but um, he said to me once, he said, why should I care about anything that's happening in rural Utah? And, and I, said, <laughs> I said a little sarcastically, um, well, um, uh, I mean, other than your water, your food, your energy, and your recreation, I can't think of any reason you should care about <laughs> rural Utah. And, and he said, okay, yeah, that, that makes some sense, and it's true. Uh, we, you know, our food matters, and our food does not come from Walmart. Our food comes from, from farmers and agriculture. It comes from rural Utah. Um, our energy, uh, whether, whether you are okay with fossil fuels or you prefer um, solar and wind, all happening in rural. Right? That's, where, that's where the space is to do all of those types of, of things. Um, water, of course, in our, our watersheds and, uh, and, and matters. And, and, uh, and, then, and then Utah is, is renowned for its, its recreation. And many of these places that we want to preserve and we want, you know, Washington, D.C., those that do, some that don't, um, that, that you want to preserve, have been preserved by people in rural Utah, by grazing their sheep on these places. It means you don't build houses there. And, and fight when you try to build houses there. Um, and, and, and it's always remarkable to me how the environmental community hasn't realized that the rural community could be their best allies because they don't want lots of these places developed because they need it for agriculture purposes and others. And, 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 and so, but, but we, as we become more urbanized and that brain drain happens, we have to think outside of the box of how we're going to do this. Um, I'm a free market guy, and I understand that people aren't going to want to move their businesses out to rural Utah for lots of reasons, but the main one is workforce. Um, and yet, and yet we claim to be free market, and we subsidize big businesses moving into Salt Lake City and Lehigh all of the time. And, and I think that makes sense when you have 9% unemployment, 8% unemployment. Maybe it makes a little less sense when there's 3% unemployment and we don't have enough people to fill the jobs that are already here. Um, could, we, could we change the incentives? Could we get people to consider working out there? And how does technology play a role in this? Um, I, I'm a firm believer, I'm a little biased because I come from a technology background, um, that, that telecommuting uh, really does pose a solution to, to some of the issues in rural Utah, we are very fortunate to have a broad fiber network because of UEN and others. Um, and one of the state's priorities has been to get gigabit ethernet into all of our schools, regardless of where they are. We've been able to do that, which has created an incredible backbone that, that very few states have in their rural areas. And, um, and we have people. And, and I, I, I don't want you to underestimate the, the, the brilliance of the people that live there. Just because you don't have a formal education doesn't mean you're, you're dumb. Um, some of the smartest people I know out there don't have an education, but they're entrepreneurs. Let me just tell you, if you grow up on a farm, if you live on a farm, you are an entrepreneur. You know how to fix stuff and make stuff work without money, which is what every startup needs. And uh, they're, they're very, very dedicated and hardworking people. They're loyal. Um, they're the best types of employees you could possibly have. And I believe that more of our thinkers here need to start thinking outside of this. Um, I love companies that are socially responsible. I think that's really important and we're seeing more and more of that. Um, I love when, when companies, you know, when a portion of their donations go to, to help feed people in Africa. I think that's really important. But I do believe that there is a large segment in our backyard of people who feel like nobody cares about them, who feel like they've been forgotten, who feel like politicians have made promises and never delivered, and, uh, and they're tired of it. And it's one of the reasons they felt like they wanted to throw a brick through the window in 2016 um, and, uh, and, and, and try, to, uh, try to, to say, hey, look, we're still here and, and, and no, one, no one cares about us right now. And, and I, the, the, on, the, on the telecommuting piece, it's one of the things, I'll, I'll share this and then I'll stop, that we're working on at the state. I, as I traveled around and talked to um, some of our Silicon Slopes friends about, about the possibility of telecommuting and having people working from home, um, and then I realized, wait a minute, why am I trying to convince them to do it when I'm the second in charge of one of the largest companies, employers, it, uh, in the state of Utah, that is the state of Utah, we have about 24,000 employees. Why don't we start seeing if we can do this? So we have a pilot project, project going on right now 
um, in, the, uh, in the state building, which is state office building, which is one time the Capitol. We have about 130 employees uh, that have been going for about six months um, that are telecommuting either completely or um, three days a week at home. Um, we have put in very strict measurements on outputs. It's a select group of people, so we, we knew not every job can do this, uh, but we wanted to try it out, and it's been remarkable. Um, first of all, just think about what that means. So these are fewer cars on the road, um, which helps with our, our air quality issues. It means we don't have to build buildings um, in stationary in fact, because we're using less buildings. Um, it's, uh, it, it's it, it, oh, and by the way, the best part of this is we've sent, seen a 22% increase in output um, and efficiency from these same employees versus their, their um, colleagues who are working in the building. Something about not having to sit in traffic and commute uh, for an hour or an hour and a half every day that, that, that makes it better for them. Um, and, uh, and, but here's the best part. Then the kid who grew up in Scipio or Laburkin, who works for the state now, can actually take their job back home with them. So now, now you've got somebody making $70,000 a year who moved back, like I was able to do, to their town, and now they're getting involved in the community, they're spending money in their community that wasn't there before, their kids are going to school in that community, they're running for office in that community, they're serving on the PTA, and you can see a revitalization starting to happen. By the way, these are great places to live. It's not for everyone, I get it, but it is for some people. It's pretty cool, it's pretty remarkable. Um, people think I'm crazy all the time, they can't believe I do this and I commute this far, until they come and see where I live, and then they get it, and, and most of them would trade me if they could. Um, I feel very fortunate. And, and so it's going to take great minds though to solve this. We've been trying for a long, long time, and it, it hasn't worked thus far. Um, we'll talk about some more solutions with Bruce here, but um, we're gonna need your help. Really smart people who, who see the world a little differently um, who can come up with some solutions. So with that, Bruce, let's, uh, let's have a conversation.
this, this thing is outside. So my, my wife's family moved to Mount Pleasant when, uh, b before she was born. So uh, 43 years ago, they moved to Mount Pleasant, and they're still considered outsiders. I like to say it's, it's kind of like in dog years. For every seven years you live there in Rosetown, that's one, right? So that's kind of how it works. Um, I, I had a remarkable experience recently that I want to share. Um, we had a couple move, an older couple, move to just outside of Fairview um, from, uh, from New York. So they had, uh, they had lived in New York, raised their family in, uh, in New York. He had worked for one of the biggest ad agencies in New York, actually came back to teach at BYU, uh, teach advertising at BYU. And, uh, and his wife, um, uh, I mean, she's brilliant, she's an artist, um, loves to give tour of the Met, um, tours of the Met in, in New York. They're world traveled, they're refined, um, they're the exact opposite of my family and everything about Fairview and the last possible uh, people that should fit in in any way. And what they did when they moved in was was just crazy. They, they built, they bought this beautiful farmhouse, a little farm, and they what usually happens is people move in and want to change everything about it. They want to make it just like where they came from. And there is nothing that pisses us off more than that. Sorry, that's how we talk. I don't have a filter. Um, we, what they did was they came down and they said, we admire everything about this place. We love the history. We love the grit. We love the rawness. We love the determination. Please teach us how to be like you. We want to be like you. Um, and they would, they are the worst farmers in the history of farming. Um, they're terrible. But they try. And so they'll call and they'll ask questions. Um, they'll have us come over and, and show them what to do. Uh, and it's so endearing that the community has just embraced them. And, and by the way, what happens once you, you've established that trust and once the community loves you, I mean, we love them. They're like our mascot um, for Fairview now. And they now, now they're teaching theater to kids from Fairview. They, 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 they're, they're taking the best of what they brought with them and sharing it with the rest of us. And that, now that gives us space to have dialogue. We're not threatened by them anymore. We, our walls are down and we're willing to listen to them and, and learn some of the things that they bring from New York that could actually make Fairview a better place. And when we have questions about, uh, about things that may be of interest to them, we, you know, we call them. And when I say we, it's not just me, it's other people as well. And so I think that that's really, really important, uh, you know, that you don't go into a place saying, you know, these dumb people that have been here for 170 years and have no idea what they're doing, and look down our noses at them and say, we're gonna fix your problem and solve it and make it a better place. And that's the easiest way to say, for, for them to say, you know what, get out of here, we don't need you, we're fine. We'll, we'll be okay. Um, but if you, if you come in and, and, uh, and, and recognize the good and try to be part of it, we'll, we'll love you. We, you know, we're, we just need a little bit of attention, um, and it goes so, so far, seriously. I mean, if you just come down and spend a little time with us, we'll, we'll embrace you. Really will. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me explore with you a little bit further than this idea of the urban and rural divide, I guess, if I could focus on that. In the class we talked about a couple of articles that came forward and said the rural rural communities, including rural Utah, is a bit of a dumping ground for urban society. We send out trash to rural Utah, we generate uh, power in rural Utah, we have um, industrialized um, food production in, in rural Utah, for example. Those things are out of sight, out of mind, but we have an impact in those communities. How, how can we as urban dwellers have a greater sympathy and understanding of rural issues? How can we be more sensitized to what we're doing has an effect outside the boundaries of an urban community? So <laughs> here's the crazy thing. Like, we're okay with you sending us your trash, and we're okay with you, you using us um, to generate your power. We're, we're okay. We begged to get the prison um, when when the point of the mountain was too full um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and 30 years ago. Sorry, I'm old. 30 years ago, and and they're looking to expand the prison.
prison. Like everybody's desperate to get rid of, of the, the prison, right? At the point of mount, and nobody wanted it when they were going to move it someplace else. Well, 30 years ago, we were fighting with each other to get the prison expanded. It came to Sandy County, it came to Gunnison, um, because it created jobs. And that mattered to us. And so, so again, we're so desperate for these jobs that we're okay with that. But, but here's, here's the point. Um, then we get, we get jerked around, right? And, and nobody cares about us. And so when you wanna close power plants and you wanna shut down coal mines, even though those coal mines and those power plants built everything you care about in this state, built this building um, on the backs of these, these coal miners, and then get treated like trash, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit your agenda. Um, that's that hurts, and, and there's a real lack of understanding. So th there's really only one way to solve that divide, whether that divide is political, um, whether that divide is environmental, um, wh whatever the divide is. The only way I've ever discovered um, to close a divide is to get proximate, and that's to get close to people. Um, one of my favorite books is um, uh, is is called Just Mercy. Um, it's a great book. Every one of you should. About civil rights, uh, it's it's written by a civil rights attorney um, who goes to the deep south uh, to represent uh, black men and and young people on um, on death row. It is a heart wrenching story. I, I just but everyone should read it. Um, and but his message, the entire takeaway from that book is getting close to people. So you will never. You will never be able to, to bridge that gap by sitting in a classroom in Salt Lake City. Never be able to do it sitting on Capitol Hill. What has to happen is you actually have to come down and spend some time at a coal mine, spend some time um, at, at the prison in Gunnison, spend some time talking with people that are down there, and then you'll start to understand. W one of the worst things we did was during the Great Recession, we got rid of what was called the rural tour. So historically, every year, we would take the legislature and take them on a tour of some place in rural Utah. And uh, that stopped happening. I was able to resurrect it a few years ago, fortunately. Um, and we had the Speaker of the House at the time, uh, who grew up in Philadelphia, um, or in, in, yeah, I think it's actually in Pittsburgh. Um, grew up there, um, lived in Salt Lake City, and, um, and, and, and this wasn't just unique to him. There were many that did this, but they went on this rural tour. We took two days. They went through about six different counties. They, they stopped in coal country. They went down towards Moab. They came, came back up through Sampy County and stopped at some farms, saw a dairy farm, how that worked, and said to me, you might as well have given me a trip to Mars. Uh, this, this was so foreign to me. And you, know, you can't make policy that impacts something that you don't even have a, a little bit of understanding. And so I encourage people all the time Come down, come down to Fairview. I'll give you a tour. I'll show you around, and it, it really will change your perspective. Um, you know, it may not change your ultimate decision and decision making, but at least it will be an informed decision, and you'll understand the consequences of those decisions a little better. A couple more questions, and then we'll open it up. Um, thank you for looking back in history, because as planners, we can all look forward, but there's so much information that we can learn from by looking back. The history of a community, um, and you talked about. Uh, the stories of your grandfather or your great grandfather, and I have a question about that. Did Butch Cassidy ever come to Fairview? So Butch Cassidy, um, he didn't. He wasn't right in Fairview. He was just north of Fairview. He was working on the railroad with uh, with some of his gang for a okay. long time, and uh, we had some pictures that were actually the the history of uh, the archives of BYU had. They they actually ran some uh, with known pictures of Butch Cassidy. They did some computer analyzation on it. And it looks like he was, yeah, just a couple miles north of Fairview. Well, he's he's my claim there you go. His claim to fame is that uh, his surname was Edward Parker, but Robert Leroy Parker was with that's Cassidy, right. so that's, exactly that's my right. link to, to Southern Assembly. Well, and I'm glad because you know he's a, he's a cousin to Governor Herbert's. Oh, is that right? He is indeed, yeah, yeah. His grandfather, Governor Herbert's grandfather, actually knew Butch. Okay. So, oh. yeah, yeah, so there you go. Okay. So, um, questions, um, Chris and uh, I've got a few questions, and maybe you could ask them to the go Lieutenant Governor, uh, Chris, and then Chris Olinger, and we can go backwards and forwards. Let's keep this to about um, 20 minutes or so to respect your time. Sure. We probably want to watch the last I, I don't quarter. know if I want to watch it now, so <laughs> okay. it's, it's fine. We'll, we'll see. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay. We're, we're, we're oh, in. oh yeah. wow. I like that. Mm -hmm. and, and really, you guys can ask me. Yeah, great question. 
Uh, the question is, what role does immigration and immigrants play in revitalization of small communities, particularly the small towns in Utah? The, the immigration question is a fascinating one uh, because uh, rural is very schizophrenic on this on this issue in that um, uh, the the agriculture community is very pro immigration. In fact, it's the only way that the agriculture community can survive. Uh, so I come from a, a long line on both sides. I, I mentioned our farm, but my mom's uh, family they uh, they they raise sheep. Um, uh, big sheep herds uh, have for generations. Uh, sheep used to be, a, actually, there was a time in Santa Fe County, it was one of the wealthiest counties in the country um, in, the, in the late 1800s, and it was because of sheep. And it's gonna go with very smart animals. As you were there, they are the dumbest animals. Um, <laughs> uh, just, it, you know, there's a moron of the animal kingdom. It's the two that, that Sam Peter are familiar, turkeys and sheep. Well, we need to spend more time together, so. <laughs> we, we, we do. Uh, no, uh, so, uh, but, but, but now, you, you really, you can't survive in large sheep herds without Peruvian immigrants, um, because the Peruvians are the best at, at this kind of stuff, and, uh, and so, uh, we, my, my uncles have employed um, Peruvians for a long time, they're great, and, uh, and, then, and then the turkey industry, so Sampi is kind of known, it's known for anything, it's for, for the turkey industry. Uh, the, the Norvest turkey processing plant in Moroni. Um, and you know, about 700 employees there. Um, historically, that's been a rounding number. It's, it's dipped down depending on, on the economy. But um, most of them, uh, by large measure, are Latino, um, and, and mostly from Mexico as well. And so I immigration is critical to that. Uh, obviously, the hospitality industry and tourism, uh, very important. And, and, and here's the issue. Like, you know, these aren't taking jobs away from Americans because Americans won't do these jobs. Um, when uh, at the turkey plant, these, most of these jobs were done by the daughters of the, the owners of the, the, the co-op there. Um, you know, my... Um, I have family members that work there as kids. Nobody wants their daughters working in the turkey plant anymore. It just doesn't doesn't happen. And so um, and so immigration is, is really really important to, to all of this. And, and again, an area where there should be lots of agreement. Um, what's what's frustrating on the immigration issue is that there is actually very broad agreement across large segments of the population over how to solve this. Uh, despite what you hear in Washington D.C. and the president. And Congress. Um, most Americans uh, believe that legal immigration is important and that we need to fix legal immigration. It's very, it's, it's really uncontroversial. Most Americans believe that we need to stop illegal immigration, that that's, that's dangerous and that there are problems associated with that. Most Americans believe that if you are here as an undocumented child, that you should be given legal status. Like DACA is really not controversial. About 60% of Republicans support DACA, which is crazy. I, I mean, you don't see that kind of agreement on just about any issue. But the problem is that um, elected officials get elected by making this a very divisive issue. Um, they raise money by making this a very divisive, divisive issue. There's very little incentive for them to solve it because it's very helpful um, for re-election, which is, makes me so angry and it's very frustrating. Um, the, the one area where there is disagreement is what do you do with adults that are, are here illegally? Um, is there a path to that? Utah came up with a solution, um, which was controversial but amazing in a red state, and we actually solved that by making a pathway for legal status, not citizenship, but legal status for anybody that was here um, illegally, and um, the Obama administration wouldn't let us, uh, wouldn't let us put it in, into to practice. They, they were arguing it's the unconstitutional. Utah the Utah Compact, it came out of the Utah Compact, that's yeah. exactly right. But, um, but rural Utah needs, needs immigration. Very, very important to uh, to our economy, uh, much as it is in, in uh, you know the United States. Yeah. Chris, another question. How do you keep rural communities rural while encouraging growth? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, sorry. The question is, uh, how do we keep uh, rural communities rural while still encouraging growth? Uh, this is the, the the hard part of economic development in rural Utah because half the people want it to happen and the other people half don't want it to happen, right? They, they uh, were our own worst enemies sometimes when it comes to this. 
So for, first of all, I think it's important that, that the growth be smart. Um, and that's why, that, that's one of the reasons I brought in Bruce uh, early on was because I realized that that could, that could change very quickly. You can preserve the, um, you can preserve the, the, the culture and the nature of a community by planning appropriately. Uh, I think that that's, that's really important. Um, but, but it's also important to help educate those in, in, in rural communities to understand that there is no status quo. Like either you're growing or you're dying. Um, and, and if you don't want to die, because, and, and that's why I bring up the, the, you know, do you want your family to live close to you? Because all of them will say yes. They say, you know, I don't want to grow. I don't want this place to change. But I want all of our kids to be able to come back and live here. Well, that's growth and that's change. And, um, you know, most of the, we're not going to get a lot of people from Salt Lake who, who want to go live in La Verca. Um, uh, but, but we will get some. And, and tourism will drive some of that. And, and then you'll get, the, you know, the problem you'll see, and we're, we're seeing this bump up in some places. I was just out in Kamis. Um, you'll see where people do, suddenly it's beautiful and there's a lot of money coming in and now the, 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 the price of, of, of land and housing is going up. And the, the locals are being priced out. Um, and, and the politics is changing, right? Because we have all these California liberals who are coming in and, and they're gonna tell us how to run this place and then they're gonna get elected and, what, you know, it's all, it's all gonna go to hell. Um, and that's, that's what we're seeing. So, I, you know, I, again, I don't have a solution for that. That's, that's the hard part. But I think by being smart and planning ahead, we actually can preserve some of that, make sure that we keep our agriculture, keep our open space, um, and that we don't lose the, the field of things. So. Thank you. So, um, kind of along that same, uh, same line, um, small towns often have beautiful main street cores growth in those cities happen outside of the historic core and the, the main street of those towns. How do we encourage the right urban growth in the right place? The question is, uh, how do we encourage the right growth in the right place? Uh, many of smaller communities are dying from the inside out. The main street issue, no one shops on main street and there's not a bike life itself. There's vitality on main street, but we have these suburbs on the outskirts that we shop somewhere else. How do we avoid that and we talk about this hollowing out of communities. The hollowing out of communities where the core is no longer really functioning as, as a gathering place. So, you, well, Bruce, you'd be able to answer this better than I would, but, but part of the problem is we don't have beautiful main streets anymore because they've already been hollowed out. They just kind of continue to fall apart. And w what I would like to see, there was a program several years ago, actually when I first became mayor, where there, there were funds available through the federal government, and I think there may be even some state funds, that, that we could use to help revitalize main streets. And, and there was like a lighting project where we could take down the, the light poles and the wires and, and uh, put them underground and do some things. We were able to do a portion of Fairview's main street, but not all of it, and it was, it was amazing. What's, what's interesting is I think there has to be a cultural change, and this is, this is true of urban, as maybe even more so than rural. We're, the good news is we're starting to see it with the revitalization of downtown in Salt Lake City. Part of this is, is your generation that is really helping to drive this. Um, and that is that, that people want convenience. Um, they want to live where they work. Um, we, we screwed up planning and transportation has such a, such a big role in this. Um, and we're, we're finally getting UDOT to understand the role that they play in this. It, it, it's always been about how do we get people from point A to point B? That's all they cared about. They didn't care about Main Street. They didn't care about what happens in, in the, the, the local areas. Um, but um, I, I love to ask this question. I'm, I'm not going to ask it in this group, but uh, well, maybe they, did, I will. they didn't care about Radiator Springs. They did. That's the name, Radiator Springs. <laughs> they did not care. They bypassed Radiator Springs, and I'm still <laughs> mad about it. Um, uh, so, so usually, in a big group of people, I will ask, "How many of you walked to school, to church, or to the grocery store? One of those three places when you were growing." And I have people raise their hand. They raise their hand. They, they, they didn't do that. Yeah. And then I ask them, how many of you do that now? Um, and you know, at a college, many of you walk to school, right? <laughs> here. Uh, but what's what's interesting is usually when I ask that question in a group of 500 people, um, probably 90% raise their hand the first time, and maybe 10 to 20% raise their hand the second time. That's planning, right? It's 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 we we um, and, and active. I mean, we have an obesity problem in this country. 
part of that is because we don't walk anywhere. We don't ride our bikes anywhere. Um, it's, we, we design things the wrong way. What's interesting is I think rural communities are actually better suited to take advantage of that change in culture than, uh, than others um, because everything, there isn't much, but what is, is still mostly there. And, uh, and that's where, again, smart planning comes in. And that's where the, the market is demanding it. The millennials are demanding that. They want trails, they want active transportation, they want, to, they want cities designed where they, they don't have to drive across town to buy something. They can do it all right there. And it's a, it's a welcome change and something that's been needed for a long time. Um, I have one question. Yes. One more question. And it's, uh, what is some of the rural communities uh, that we have in Utah and, and small towns depend on public land or public land access, etc. But we often see, again, a confrontation between communities and public land agencies and federal land managers. Is there an opportunity for rural Utah and small communities be much more cooperative and collaborative with federal agencies and potentially their own mutual benefit? So, yeah, great question. And this is this is one of the biggest struggles that we've had in Utah for a long, long time, since the, the 1930s. And, and it is that clash. Uh, um, and and, and the, the answer, the, the simple answer is yes, there is so much room for collaboration. Now, there are some areas where we're never going to agree, uh, but, uh, a, a ray of light, the Emory County Lands Bill that was recently passed um, is, is a huge, huge deal, and everyone should look at that as a model for how this can be done. What's really interesting is, much like the immigration issue, um, there's, there's probably 80 to 90 percent of our lands that really aren't that disputed um, on both ways, where, where most everyone except for the extremes agrees that this should be protected, it should never be disturbed, it's, it's, it's precious and important. And then there are other public lands where everybody agrees like, yeah, there's no reason to add any special protection to that. Why are we arguing over that? But what happens is, uh, because nobody's willing to give an inch, then we have to fight over everything. And so, uh, by, by deciding, okay, we know we're not gonna agree on these parcels of land, they're disputed, but we can all agree on this, we can all agree on this, let's, let's do the thing we can agree upon. And, and, and let's not be afraid, it, it's really interesting to me, we all like to argue on the left and right that, that, um, that we believe in science and that we believe in evidence until the evidence contradicts our deeply held beliefs and then we're out, right? And so my party gets, gets blamed all the time for not believing in climate change, right? Uh, and, and, that's, and, and that's, I understand those arguments. But what we've also seen, for example, on grazing, um, the, the, the science behind grazing is, is really, really interesting and, and, and grazed appropriately is, is actually very healthy for the land. And, and healthier than not grazing. Um, one of the big mistakes we've made, we have, we have bark beetles that have infest, infested many of our trees, um, and, and the decision was made that we can't touch those trees, and, and the bark, the, the beetle has destroyed those trees, which is now leading to catastrophic wildfire, and uh, which is, you know, if you want to talk about air pollution, look at the fires we had last year, it was far worse than anything else we were doing in the state. Um, when those trees could have been harvested um, early, once the, they were first infected, could have been harvested and used in a productive manner um, that would have created jobs and, uh, and actually been a win-win. There are all these win-wins that because, because we fought for so long, we're not, willing to, uh, we're not even willing to have those conversations anymore. And so those are the areas where I think we can find common ground. And I'm so excited about the Emory County Lands Bill because um, it, we tried to do it on a bigger scale. It didn't work out and there were some actors on both sides who weren't um, trustworthy, I guess, for lack of a better term at the table. But this is what, this came out of that, what was called the PLI process, uh, the Public Lands Initiative. Uh, this piece survived. Um, it was supported by three county commissioners in every county who were very conservative and created additional wilderness. Um, again, things that never would have happened, but, but also then opened up some spaces um, for people to use for uh, multiple use, for recreation, um, and uh, and for some economic development as well. So th there there are wins out there. And the reason I ask is because of the example that I have from Miller County. Yeah. Miller County working with the BLM, for example, they have a lot of get rid of BLM land, and it's been a very cooperative relationship. It goes and ebbs and flows yeah. like everywhere else. But, but the wind farms, the wind, uh, the wind, the wind farms, farms down there on, on, on BLM property, uh, again, uh, a win-win. We get cleaner energy. Um, there are some jobs that are created. 
It's done on public land and never, but the, but the land is still protected. Okay. Um, Maybe the last two questions. Planning has often been interpreted as being a pub, a, a big, big government uh, directive, and being focused on urban areas. How do we, how do we size planning to meet the needs of smaller communities, but also interpret and define planning to meet their needs and not someone else's, the, their own local definition of planning. And, and I think you, you know, you partially answered the question by, <laughs> by defining it in the. In no, 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 I'm glad. I, again, you, these answers are much better for you. You ask me the questions, I call guys like Bruce to help answer them. Um, but uh, but it's, it, it really is that. It takes local involvement. And, and look, like everything else, there are, there are extreme plans. And, and as a free market person, you have to understand the market and, and people's rights and abilities to use their land for the purposes that they want. And, and the, the less restrictive, I mean, if we're going to err, let's always err on the side of being less restrictive rather than more restrictive. So that's something that's very important to me. Now that being said, um, it's, it's easy to point out uh, the places people don't like to be stuck in traffic forever. Um, people, you know, people, you, you, you help people understand how this elevates the value of their property so that now there's a, a personal stake in that, how the planning is actually good for them. And, and I think going through that education process, but more, more important than anything else is making sure that it's driven at the local level, that they are giving their input about how they want their community to look like. And not to, one, one of the problems we have in rural Utah, and I did a little bit today, is we treat it as, as, um, as one ubiquitous whole, right? All rural communities are the same, and they're not. They all are very different. They all have their flavor, and it's something I focused on as a mayor, was what, what do what do we want Fairview to look like when it grows up? What does Mount Pleasant want to look like? How, how can we, um, and regional planning matters too, how can we help each other instead of fighting over the same stuff? Because that's how, that's how businesses take advantage of us, right, is they get a bunch of communities to fight over it, to race to the bottom, and, and you have winners and losers when we all should be able to win and participate in that winning. And there, there is some uh, policy stuff that needs to go along with that. I think there's some tax policy stuff we need to look at where um, you know, we've rewarded local communities with retail uh, taxes, and so you're fighting to get that retail tax in your community, and somebody else doesn't get it, and yet your community members are going to be shopping there. And you know, so is there a way to evenly distribute that a little better so we're not fighting over the same stuff, which I think helps with the planning process. And I think this people is working together. That there is. That's right, the zoning for dollars piece. I, you know, I've got, I've got friends in Kansas City, and if you want an interesting, uh, if you want to look at an interesting case study, um, Kansas City, Kansas versus Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, the, the race to the bottom and what's happening there, and they're trying desperately to figure out how to work together so that they're not being taken advantage of. Right. Um, you alluded to the, the, the urban, rural, political divide. How should either party appeal to the opposite geography? Meaning, how should Democrats appeal to the rural communities and how should Republicans appeal to the urban communities? This, this question is about the divide, a continued divide, but now in a political context. How can we understand one another from different parties and build unity for our country, our states, and our, our, our communities, but and our smaller communities? How, how do we work together? And still respect one another. So I think we're better at this in Utah than a lot of other places, but we we're also slowly going downhill in, in that in that way. Um, I, I will say uh, I'm going to give another book recommendation. I, I, I the the Ben Sass book deals with this um, quite a bit. There's there's an even better book on just specifically on this topic, and that it just came out um, by Arthur Brooks. It's called Love Your Enemy, and uh, again I, I understand he's you know he's conservative, but this book is not about being conservative at all. It's about how we talk to each other. Um, and what, what he will tell you and what I believe is the first thing we have to do is move, remove contempt from our language. Um, contempt, this entire book is really about contempt um, and, 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 how we, uh, and how we talk to one another. Um, if, you know, if, you, if you feel like using the eye roll emoji um, in response, 
So we, we heard it, we, we hear it routinely on, on both sides. Um, you know, Hillary referring to people where I live as deplorables, right? That was, that, that got a big one. Um, you know, um, my, my good friend, Senator Romney, who regrets to this day, talking about the, the 47, 46 percent, 47 percent, whatever the, the number was, right? Um, that, that kind of, that kind of language. So I think we need to, we need to start there. Um, there, there are definitely some examples of doing this uh, a better way. I think, again, Senator Sass is a really good example. Unfortunately, he's not on social media much anymore, and he talks about that in his book. Um, but of, of talking with others who are different in understanding. Um, interestingly, on the left, uh, I'll just throw this out there, I've been very fascinated by the, the writing of Mayor Pete um, Buttigieg, who um, somehow is the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which is like smaller than West Jordan. Um, is the best uh, politician on the left that I've seen in a long, long time. Um, it's interesting to hear him talk about it, talk about it, uh, the, 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 the right, um, talk about, hear him talk about, what was he talking about the other day? Chick-fil-A, I think, um, you know? Uh, he had a really interesting answer um, in, in giving, in, in wanting to understand people instead of criticizing them for supporting the Republican candidate, for, for supporting, President Trump, he was more interested in understanding why. Um, what was it that led people to, to vote for him um, in the face of, uh, of some stuff that, that would normally not be, not normally, has never been acceptable for any candidate, right? Every, violated every norm of politics, and yet was able to get elected. And, and so he spoke to them in human terms, um, not, I can't believe what's wrong with these people, how could you be so stupid to, to vote for this guy? Um, he said, yeah, I, I, I want to understand why they did it and, and try to figure that out and what do I have that can help um, solve the problems that, that they perceive. And I, and I think that's a, a really big piece. I've tried really hard um, over the past five years in my position to do, to do better at that, to do more of that. Um, I'm very disappointed with my party at times because I, you know, somebody said to me once, how can you, how can you be a conservative and say you care about people? Um, and I, I, I said to them, I, I'm a conservative because I care about people and I really believe that the, that the things I, I care about will lift people and help people, um, but we haven't done a very good job of explaining the why behind that. And it's so cliche, but you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, but it's also really true. Like, if you don't treat me as a human and care about me on a, on a human level and get proximate to me, I'm never gonna listen to anything you have to say. So, so again, uh, uh,
And so we, we are working internally. Um, we've got a planning group together that is focusing specifically on these issues. We're working with policymakers in the legislature as well um, to, uh, to talk about what can and should be done. Um, again, at the community level is where we desperately need it. Uh, we need people to be focusing on that, uh, on looking ahead, planning ahead. We're, we plan out our transportation budgets um, and our transportation projects, we have 20 year plans, 30 year plans, we're really looking ahead at this stuff. Unfortunately, sometimes things change so rapidly that are unexpected. Like the rise of Silicon Slopes, nobody saw that coming. And if they did, they're lying to you. Um, uh, we, we knew it would grow, but not so fast. I mean, we have interchanges down there at Lehigh that we're supposed to turn, you know, that we're supposed to be, and, and portions of freeway that we're supposed to be 30 at capacity in 30 years that in five years we're at capacity. So we're gonna go to the city of Lehigh and plan for that? I thought we, we were planning ahead and yeah. thinking about these issues. They, I, I mean, they plan for something. I don't think they plan for that scope and magnitude um, of it happening so quickly. And uh, and so we're everybody's trying to get their, their arms around this, but the important part is that we, we recognize that it's an issue. We do have to plan ahead, but let me, let me say the other say one more thing about that too, not just on the planning side, but um, the reason people are coming to Utah is not because we're exactly like Silicon Valley. In fact, it's because we're different than Silicon Valley. And there's a lot of people who like the difference, and the difference is that we have lives outside of, you know, outside of our companies and our businesses um, that we like to recreate and we have recreation opportunities here. And one of the biggest mistakes we can make is um, copying Silicon Valley um, because it's it's the distinction that made it happen. Anybody could just copy Silicon Valley, but we need to make this Utah. That's why I, I, I almost don't like the Silicon Slopes moniker um, because it harkens a little bit back to that too much, but we care about family and we care about time away from the office and we care about community and, uh, and giving back and culture and, and building those communities. And so, um, I think, and by the way, I do think businesses play a big role. I talked about the, the loss of the um, the Rotary Club and some of those things. I think businesses can actually fill that role, and we do have some very socially responsible businesses. Coda Taxi is a great example of that. Um, hiring refugees, um, doing good for the sake of doing good. And by the way, it also turns out to be really good for business. I think if you're genuine about it, um, we give up, we, in my own company, we would pay our employees to volunteer in the local schools to give back and build in, build community, give some of those roles. Turns out, you know, you think if, you know, the, the, the bean counters would tell us, you can't pay your employees to not work, to go do service, that's a terrible idea. Well, it turns out that they, uh, they actually like working for us more. We have lower turnover. They actually work harder when they are at work because it's a positive environment. And so we think it does pay. And, uh, and so that's, that's one way I think we can do better and the Silicon Slopes can do better than, uh, than other places. So we've, we've had a few monikers in Utah. We've got Street Sheet in Tama. Do you have some thought about technology in Utah? Or something like? For sure. We're still in that. We're, fortunately, we're, we're out of the Utah. You, most of you won't remember this, but this was a real, a real moniker, a real slogan for the state of Utah that somebody thought was a good idea and that people used for a long time. Utah, a pretty great state. Um, <laughs> right? So bad. So bad. Um, you know, life elevated has been the, the moniker, and, and there's lots of different plays on that. But um, still, one I, I'm I'm kind of fond of. I do like. I, I was not responsible for it, but I, I do believe that we're very lucky and privileged where we live, and be doing what we're doing, and, and being able to collaborate. And that's that's the difference in Utah. I hear it all the time. Utah is unique because we're willing to work together. Republicans and Democrats, um, urban, rural. We actually can solve problems, and I think we can be an example to the nation. Okay. Thank you.
council member to mayor of County Commissioner, House of Representatives, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, maybe it's the same 10 people that step up again and do the same thing, but we'll continue to watch what, what comes next. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with it.